Hey everybody, Roger the Spaceman says hey. Scarlet says hey, she's right below me right now. So today we are doing another space video. As you guys know, I am interested, actually very interested in space, mainly because I'm a big Star Trek fan and I think I kind of fell in love with space through that show. It's just kind of cool thinking about there's this whole other vastness out there that we generally are completely unaware of in our day-to-day -day lives. And just the thought of like exploring what's out there, I don't know, there's just kind of a level of excitement excitement and just wonderment and curiosity there that at least I have. And it's kind of like the opposite of like learning history. I feel like space stuff is mostly like looking forward. I always wanted to live in the Star Trek universe and so anything that gets us closer to that I'm just like so gung-ho for. So that said, most of my learning when it comes to space exploration has to do with kind of like the golden age of NASA back in the late 50s and 60s when they landed on the moon and all of that stuff. And yes, I do believe in the moon landings, okay? <laughs> and the space shuttle program was pretty cool, but the shuttle never went out of Earth orbit, but it did contribute a lot to the International Space Station. And I think they were able to do a lot of scientific experiments with it. And now we're like trying to get back to the moon and get humans on Mars. And beyond that, I don't know, but, but I do know that the United States is not the only country in the world with a space program. There are other countries, and occasionally we hear about them in the news like China, India, and so forth. I the Israel, you know? And I have done a video on the Indian space program about like how much more cost efficient it is than NASA. But this video is going to let me know kind of where all of the different nations stand other than NASA, because everybody knows about NASA, but what is out there other than NASA? And in this video also we'll go into what do they do. So it's not only understanding kind of their budgets, but also kind of what they contribute to the space exploration. So looking forward to this, let's have a look at it. Hello, welcome to Neil Scribe. Between SpaceX and NASA, it is easy to get lost in American space exploration. NASA's budget is the largest of all space agencies in the world at $22 billion. However, the next top 10 countries in space funding spends a combined $24 billion on space programs. Wow. I didn't know the discrepancy was that big. And honestly, for an American budget, like 22, like I think our total budget is a few trillion dollars. I'm not sure exactly, I'd have to look it up. But 22 billion is actually not a whole lot in comparison to the budget as a whole. I, I don't know, like I just feel like 22 billion isn't enough. But man, tw I didn't, I did not realize that NASA spent almost the same as the rest of the top 10 countries. Wow. So we're going to briefly explore how these 10 countries contribute to space exploration, starting with Canada at number 10. Canada spends around $315 million on its space program, the Canadian Space Agency, or CSA. Canada's history in space actually traces back to 1962 with its first satellite, the Owlet-1. And today, CSA operates a substantial fleet of satellites and has contributed to many space exploration missions from agencies all around the world. For example, they developed the Alpha Particle X-ray Spectrometer for NASA's Mars Curiosity rover. But the CSA project that I'm most excited about is the Canadarm3. Canadarm3 is a smart robotic system for the Lunar Gateway. The system will be able to maintain, repair, and inspect the gateway, capture visiting vehicles, relocate gateway modules, and help astronauts during spacewalks. All right, now let's move on to number nine. What's the Lunar Gateway? <laughs> is that a satellite that they're gonna be using for further moon landings or something? Is there already in space? Nine, South Korea. South Korea spends around $600 million on its space program, the Korea Aerospace Research Institute, or CARI. CARI is developing the three-stage Nuri rocket, the country's first indigenously developed launch vehicle slated to launch in 2021. CARI has a strong focus on satellite R&D with six satellites in operation and four in development involving various purposes such as meteorological and marine observation. But the most exciting thing to me coming out of South Korea has to be the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter or KPLO. KPLO is scheduled to launch in July 2022 via SpaceX Falcon 9. The orbiter will explore the lunar environment to provide us a further understanding of its resources. It will also investigate potential landing sites for future missions. And perhaps it will play a role in determining the landing spot for NASA's Artemis 3 mission. 
All right, now let's head over. That's really cool, like how they're working together. The different agencies are working together. So this implies that South Korea's agency is working with NASA, and also they're working with a private company with the with Falcon. Falcon is uh, Elon Musk, right? I'm not sure. I think that I think that's right. I haven't really looked into the private uh, space exploration stuff yet. Literally, most of my learning about it has just been on like the Apollo program with NASA. So I know very very little about the um, more private uh, companies. Over to Europe to number eight, the UK. The UK spends around $900 million on space between the United Kingdom Space Agency or UKSA and its contributions to the European Space Agency or ESA. The UK is responsible for almost 10% of ESA's budget, so a lot of the country's space exploration contributions will be acknowledged when we go over ESA. However, there are some exciting things happening in the UK outside of ESA. The UK space sector has been experiencing a significant resurgence. Its space sector has risen to almost 15 billion pounds, which heavily involves satellite manufacturing. And this resurgence is fitting considering the UK was the third country to operate a satellite with the Ariel 1 in 1962. And the UK's goal is to build off its momentum and capture 10% of the global space economy by 2030. And they aim to achieve this in large part by becoming the go-to launch destination for Europe's small satellite manufacturers. In 2018, the country announced its first spaceport called the Sutherland, which will be operated by the UKSA. Once completed, the spaceport will be home to the Prime rocket developed by the UK company Orbex and is expected to launch in 2021. So I'd imagine that this is exciting times for space fans in the United Kingdom. Okay, number seven is Italy, which spends around $1.1 billion between its $666 million contribution to ESA and its $468 million in its funding for its space program, the Agencia Speciale Italiana. Or okay, this is actually surprising. I wouldn't have thought Italy would be spending more on space stuff than the UK. Or ASI. Like the UK, a lot of Italy's space contributions will be credited when we cover ESA, as it's responsible for 13% of ESA's funding. However, Italy brings a lot to the table in their own right. Italy, along with France, is responsible for the funding of the ESA-operated Vega rocket manufactured by the Italian company Avio. Italy also provides a lot of scientific instruments for space explorations from various agencies around the world. One example is Italy's two instruments on NASA's Juno mission, including an infrared imaging spectrometer. And ASI is largely responsible for the funding and development of the ESA and Roscosmos operated ExoMars mission. The ExoMars mission is truly epic, I could do a whole video on it, but it involves an orbiter, lander, and rover. Okay, number six is India. We are now getting into the heavy hitters that could each easily have their own videos listing all of their accomplishments. So India spends around $1.5 billion on its space program, the Indian Space Research Organization or ISRO. Since India launched its first satellite in 1975, it has become a significant satellite launch provider on a global scale. ISRO's excellence can be illustrated by just two of its missions. First is its Mars orbital mission with the Manglian space probe. Of the 45 Mars missions throughout history, only 23 were successful and India was successful on its first try. And the second mission that I want to point out is Israel's lunar probe Chandrayaan-1. Chandrayaan-1 contained the NASA mini-SAR experiment that discovered the presence of water in more than 40 craters in just that one experiment. So thanks to Chandrayaan-1, the world has a renewed interest in the moon, which will hopefully lead to humanity's permanent presence on the lunar surface. And now number five, Germany. Germany spends around $2.1 billion in space, with $981 million going to ESA funding, which is 20% of ESA's budget. I was definitely expecting Germany to be up towards the top because, you know, I've seen German engineering in a lot of my videos. You know, the, the, a lot of German scientists came over to the U.S. post-World War II and worked with NASA. So Germany's got it going on when it comes to uh, engineering and, and space. Uh, I guess the space industry. And the rest goes to their space program, DLR. DLR's contributions to space is far-reaching. The agency operates the ISS Columbus Laboratory, which is ESA's most significant contribution to the space station. Additionally, DLR has participated in many missions from agencies all around the world. For example, it developed a high-resolution stereo camera for ESA's Mars Express mission. And DLR also developed the heat flow and physical properties package for NASA's InSight Lander, allowing it to measure the heat flowing in the interior of Mars. 
Okay, on to number four, Japan. Japan spends $3 billion, and of that $3 billion, $1.7 billion goes to their civil space program, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA. Japan was the fourth country to launch its own satellite, the Asumi, in 1970. JAXA's most significant achievement so far, in my opinion, is the Kibo Laboratory on the ISS that Japan spent over 20 years and $2.4 billion developing. Well, that's interesting. They have their flag in Japan on that portion of the space station. So do all of the countries that have contributed to the space station have like a flag representing their contribution to it? I didn't know that that existed. Kibo is Japan's first manned space vessel. And one of my favorite JAXA missions is the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft launched in 2014. The spacecraft surveyed the 162173 Ryugu asteroid for a year and a half and is currently on its way back to Earth with asteroid samples. This mission showcases some incredible technologies such as ion engines, autonomous navigation, and close movement on objects with low gravity. And since 2013, JAXA and the Mitsubishi Heavy Industries have been developing the two-stage H3 launch vehicle, which will be JAXA's flagship rocket, slated to launch by late 2020. H3 will have a payload capacity of 4,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit, and they're also considering developing a triple core heavy variant that could support NASA's Lunar Gateway. And in 2022, JAXA will launch the Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, or SLIM. SLIM will be Japan's first lunar surface mission, and it will demonstrate precision landing technology that will set the stage for future lunar missions. Okay, number three is France. France is a centerpiece of space exploration in Europe, both literally and figuratively. That's surprising. I would have never guessed that. Huh. ESA is headquartered in Paris, and France spends around $3.1 billion in space funding, and is the most significant contributor to ESA at almost 27%. Of that, $1.8 billion goes to their space program, Centro Nacional de Tout Spatial, or CNES. CNES was formed all the way back in 1961, and today the agency's reach is vast, collaborating in over 70 projects and missions all around the world. CNES oversaw the development of the Seismic Experiment for Interior Structure of NASA's InSight Lander that is currently studying Mars. And that is just one example of the 70 programs and missions that CNES is involved in. On top of that, CNES is involved with the development of 42 future projects and missions. The agency also developed the Ariane 5 rocket with the help of Germany, which is ESA's primary launch vehicle. And now we're going to dive deeper into ESA, considering that the UK, Italy, Germany, and France account for over 70% of its budget. But let's quickly acknowledge ESA's remaining member states. There's Austria, Belgium, Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Greece, Hungary, Ireland, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Spain, Sweden, and Switzerland. So ESA was formed in 1975 to coordinate the financial resources so that its members can work on programs far beyond the scope of any single European country. As mentioned earlier, ESA has a fleet of two rocket families in the Arian and Vega and also purchases Soyuz vehicles from Russia for its medium-sized payloads. ESA has led or participated in 31 completed missions and has a hefty 25 missions currently in operation. Through these missions, ESA has explored throughout the solar system such as the Sun, Mercury, Venus, the Moon, Mars, Saturn and its moon Titan, and many others. And ever since its formation, the agency has been a great partner to NASA stemming back to 1978 with the International Ultraviolet Explorer, or IUE, the world's first high-orbit telescope. But the ESA projects that I'm most excited about are the two modules that they are developing for the Lunar Gateway. One module is the European System Providing Refueling Infrastructure and Telecommunications, or ESPRIT. And the second module is the International Habitation Module that will be developed in collaboration with JAXA. Okay, now we can get back to number two, Russia. Russia spends 3.4 billion- Two? Okay, I was expecting them to be number one. So who is number one? I bet you it's China, isn't it? I bet you, I bet you it's China. ...million dollars on its space program, Roscosmos. Russia's history in space exploration goes without saying, tracing back to the Soviet Union. Today, Russia's impact in space can be illustrated by the incredible Russian Orbital Segment, or ROS. ROS is a five-module segment of the ISS and cost Russia over $12 billion. And since the space shuttle's retirement in 2011, the world has relied on the Russian Soyuz launch vehicle to access the ISS. 
Introduced in 1966, the Soyuz has stood the test of time thanks to its simplicity and high reliability. Having launched over 1,700 times, the most of any other rocket family by far. And Russia has a significant space sector encompassing 100 companies and supports a quarter of a million jobs. And the Roscosmos project that I'm most excited about is the multi-purpose crew airlock module for the Lunar Gateway. All right, and now we go to the number one country in space funding besides the US, China. China spends $5.8 billion in space between its military space funding and its space program, the Chinese National Space Agency, or CNSA. China has a long fleet of launch vehicle families between the Kaozu and the Long March, and is currently developing the massive Long March 9, slated for completion by 2028. Long March 9 will be a super heavy class rocket and will have roughly the same payload capacity as the Saturn V did. And over the past decade, CNSA has launched several space laboratories that have since deorbited. But the agency plans to launch a modular space station beginning in 2021 that will be about one-fifth the size of the ISS. You know what I'm noticing? <laughs> I think the the new um, US Space, um, space Force has a logo similar with this like uh, triangle type uh, design in it. The, the Star Trek logo is very, very similar to that as well. A lot of people were um, making fun of the Space Force logo as copying Star Trek, but China's got kind of the same one here. I'm wondering if that's like more of a universal like space design logo than what I had originally thought because a lot of people seem to use it. <laughs> so. CNSA is also gearing up for their second attempt at exploring Mars with the ambitious Tianwen-1, set to launch in July, which includes an orbiter, lander, and rover. However, most interesting to me is China's lunar exploration program. The program dates back to 2007 with the Chang'e-1 orbiter, and China has since completed five more lunar missions, including another orbiter and several landers and rovers. And it has another four more lunar missions planned through the 2020s and ultimately wants to establish a moon base. Okay, so there you have it. That is the top 10 countries besides the United States in space funding. Okay, well, there were definitely some surprises on that list. I was not aware of all of those space agencies, and I know that there are more than that, you know. Um, I, I have heard of Israel's, for instance, so I guess they're just not in the top 10 as far as funding goes. But what I found really cool about this video more than anything else was just the collaboration that's happening, with maybe the exception of China. I don't know if China is collaborating with with anybody else. But as far as the other countries, this seems to be a lot of collaboration between each other and with NASA, for instance, which I thought was really, really cool. I think if there's one thing on this planet that can bring everybody together, it would be something like space ex exploration because it's just such a huge feat that it, no one country can really do it by themselves. They really do need to collaborate with the best minds, best engineers, best scientists from around the world in order to achieve what they need to achieve. I think that's the coolest thing about it, honestly. And while yes, NASA is kind of at the top of the game, they wouldn't be able to do what they do without the contributions of these other countries as well. So a lot of this was really cool. The Lunar Gateway though is something new, I think. I've not heard of it before. So so it sounds like that they're in the process of designing it or building it right now. And I'm hearing a lot about, you know, moon landings again. So I feel like that's going to be a thing coming up here in the near future. So that would definitely be something for another video, I think, to look into. Anyway, you guys let me know in the comments below what you guys thought about all of this stuff. It'd be great to hear from you. And also hit the like button if you enjoyed this video as well. And also subscribe to my channel if you haven't done that yet. So I'm going to be continuing with these space videos because again like I really really want to get more into this topic. Just a quick mention if you do like space stuff and you happen to be a Star Trek fan I do have a Star Trek podcast. You'll find the link to it in the description and pinned comment if you're interested in checking that out. I also have all of my social media and Patreon links there as well and you'll find my PO box info in the description if you're looking for that. Well Space Roger here and I thank you guys for watching as always. Stay tuned for more coming up on my channel and we'll see you guys next time.